Evidence disproving evolution is proof of evolution. Something killed the dinosaurs, and we address a question about the problem of fossils in the mailbag. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins Controversy. Proudly brought to you by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, coming to you live from my garage. We continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we give glory to our creator while we do it. Broadcasting right across Canada on the Miracle Channel, all over the U.S. on the Walk Television, satellites all around the globe, and of course, the Chris Ginema Network on YouTube. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show, where you can find us and subscribe to our YouTube channel and get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. This past week, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Scientists, researchers reported on some fossil bacteria that haven't changed in over two billion years. The sulfur-eating bacteria are still around today, so that's how they know they haven't changed. Now, according to evolution, life is supposed to change over time. According to the biblical account of creation, ten times in the first chapter of Genesis, it states that God created all life to reproduce after its kind. In other words, dogs will turn into dogs, cows will turn into cows, and humans will turn into humans, and bacteria will turn into bacteria. So, if we were to ask the question, if creation were true, what would the evidence be? One of those answers would be stasis. Life forms faithfully reproducing after their kind and not changing. So we see a stark contrast between the expected evidence of the two models. Evolution would predict major changes over time. Creation would predict stasis, essentially no change over time. So what do we see in the fossil record? Well, here we have a fossil garfish alleged to be 40 million years old. We know it's a garfish because garfish are still around today. 40 million years of evolution has caused the garfish to evolve into garfish. This is a... A shrimp. You guessed it. How did you know? Because you can go down to the grocery store and buy them today. Tens of millions of years of evolution has caused the shrimp to evolve into shrimp. An alleged 3.4 billion years of evolution has caused stromatolites to evolve into stromatolites. Dragonflies are alleged to have been around for some 300 million years. 300 million years of evolution has caused the dragonfly to evolve into the dragonfly. Horseshoe crabs have evolved into horseshoe crabs, etc. I could provide dozens and dozens of examples of fossil life that is faithfully reproduced after its kind. Now, the other thing you see in the fossil record is extinction. Well, extinction does not help evolution one iota. Evolution is supposed to be the origin of the species, not the extinction of the species. Well, my Bible talks about life reproducing faithfully after its kind and a mass extinction known as the worldwide flood of Noah. The fossil record matches what the biblical history would predict and is the opposite of what evolution would predict. Our lead story is another fine example of stasis in the fossil record. Now, while obviously I don't believe the age the researchers assigned to these fossil bacteria, I am going to use their age to make the point. I'm using their data. According to these researchers, 2.3 billion years of evolution has caused these bacteria to evolve into bacteria. 
wow, that's starting to sound an awful lot like evidence for creation and refutation of evolution. But never fear. In response to this very nagging question, Fizz.org presented one of the most profound oxymorons ever stated in Earth's history in writing. An international team of scientists has discovered the greatest absence of evolution ever reported. A type of deep sea microorganism that appears not to have evolved over more than 2 billion years. But the researchers say that the organism's lack of evolution actually supports Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Really? So the greatest absence of evolutionary change is proof of evolution? That's like saying the greatest absence of alchemy is proof of alchemy. Come on, guys, you're smarter than this. Aren't you? But let's dig into this, because this past week I had multiple YouTubers tell me I didn't understand evolution, and that I should watch a few YouTube videos on evolution basics. Well, actually, you guys don't understand evolution. But because I don't have the same misunderstandings of evolution that you do, you assume it's because I don't understand evolution. <laughs> right, so as you can see here, if organisms change over time, it's deemed proof of evolution. If organisms don't change over time, even if that time is 2.3 billion years, it's still proof of evolution. Now, when you were taught evolution in high school, what was always depicted? That's right, gradual change. Ape to man, fish to land walking creature, dinosaurs into birds, small land animal evolving into a horse. This is what is portrayed when teaching people evolution, and it is presented as proof of evolution. Well, let's take a look at each of these and note first that they all involve change over time. Radical change over time. So make up your mind. Is evolution change over time or stasis? Usually the textbooks present examples of change over time exhibited in the fossil record. Okay, first example, ape to man. This is what is presented. But this is actually the sequence we find. And this is based upon the dates provided by the evolutionists. Dates which I disagree with. We find completely modern human footprints, the Laetoli footprints, in rocks dated by the evolutionary camp as older than Lucy and our ape-like ancestors. Now I'm referring here, of course, to evidence provided by the evolutionists. There is copious amounts of fossil evidence that humans existed in the evolutionary Cretaceous and even the Carboniferous periods, as we discussed in season one of Genesis Week. Completely modern, bipedal human footprints, which are unique to humans, in rocks way older than any of our alleged ape-like ancestors. We find the Neanderthals and Denisovans, who were completely human in every respect. Physiologically, genetically, even mentally, they may have been superior to humans, as the Neanderthals had a larger brain than we did. So there is no ape-to-man fossil sequence. It doesn't exist. Only fossils interpreted to be evolutionary dead ends. The only place this sequence appears is in textbooks and museum displays. So if the fossil sequence is in the correct order, it is presented as proof of evolution. If the fossils are found in the incorrect order, it is still presented as proof of evolution. Horse evolution is a big one you'll often see presented in textbooks, but again, the only place the fossil sequence exists is in the textbooks. First of all, when displayed, the Heracotherium and Mesohippus skeletons are always displayed with their backs in an unnatural position. You can tell this by looking at the spines, specifically the spinous process. Horses have a spine that droops down, while these animals have a spine that arched up. Yet the skeletons are depicted with the backs flattened or even reverse arched in order to better match the horse spine and give the illusion that these animals are somehow related to the horses. The fossil sequence is presented as the Heracotherium being found in the oldest, deepest rock layers, with the modern horse found in the uppermost, youngest layers of rock. This is presented as proof of evolution. Yet in South America, the fossil sequence is reversed, 
with the modern horse fossils found in rocks older than the Heracotherium. If these fossils are found in the correct order, it is called proof for evolution. If they are found in the reversed order, it is still called proof of evolution and presented as such in textbooks and museum displays. We are taught that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Proof of evolution from the fossil record, complete with alleged feathered dinosaurs. But when you look at the actual fossils, first of all, there's huge questions about these alleged feathers and if they are feathers at all. They are called proto-feathers or a half feather that hasn't quite evolved yet. Many evolutionists have argued, and I think correctly, that these are not feathers at all, but decayed collagen fibers. Others have questioned whether or not they are dinosaurs instead of just flightless birds. But yet, let's take the claims at face value. When you put the fossils in question into sequence, it's the opposite of the evolution sequence. The fully formed feathers appear on what probably flight were flightless birds, then dinosaurs with proto feathers. So if the sequence matches what the evolutionist wants, it is presented as proof of evolution. When the sequence is the opposite of what evolution propones, it is still called proof of evolution with the assumption that these feathered dinosaurs were simply evolutionary dead ends. When we get to the fishopods, the alleged sea to land connection where fish evolved into land walking tetrapods, uh, many squeal with glee over the alleged evidence. A beautiful sequence was presented in the textbooks as showing the fossil evidence of fish evolving legs and feet to walk up onto land. Now there was an annoying gap in the middle though, a missing link, if you'll pardon the moniker. Neil Shubin decided to search for a fossil of this missing link in rocks that were dated by evolutionary assumptions as the correct age of the missing link, which turned out to be northern Canada, and he found Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik was alleged to be another perfect half fish, half land walking creature, showing more steps in the evolutionary of the leg and feet. Anti creationists ran amok, mocking creationists saying this didn't just prove evolution, it fulfilled a prediction of evolution. Really? So let me ask a prediction of evolution then. If we were to look in rocks older than Tiktaalik, Tiktaalik, which was evidently in the process of developing feet, would evolution predict that we would find evidence of feet or would it predict never finding evidence of feet? Well, of course, the correct answer has to be that, according to evolutionary predictions, you would find no evidence of feet in rocks older than Tiktaalik, because feet were not supposed to have evolved yet. That was the alleged prediction that Tiktaalik fulfilled. But when we look in the fossil record, we find fossil footprints in Poland, which were dated by the evolutionists as older than Tiktaalik. Evolutionists then played this anti-evidence, a failed evolutionary prediction, as still evidence for evolution. They claimed the fishopods, including Tiktaalik, must have branched off and evolved feet separately. Now, creationists have also pointed out fossil footprints in the Tapeats sandstone of Grand Canyon, which anyone can go see for themselves if they're willing to hike. And those rocks are dated by evolution as at least 125 million years before Tiktaalik evolved. So when we lay out the precious evolution of the tetrapod, we find that that sequence is also topsy-turvy, with land walking animals with fully formed feet appearing long before feet were supposed to have evolved. Now I hope you see what I'm starting to get at here. The evidence is quite irrelevant. The evidence is always presented in favor of evolution, no matter what. This is not science. This is a faith. Interpreting the evidence to fit the faith, no matter what. Even if the evidence goes against the faith, it is reinterpreted to fit into the faith. Yet the evidence that runs the opposite of evolution mysteriously never seems to make it into textbooks and museum displays. Meanwhile, creation is the faith that fits the facts. Creation has no problem with extinction in the fossil record. 
it would predict stasis in life forms, which is what we see. While there will be some sorting of organisms during a flood, we could expect to see organisms just about anywhere in the rock record. What ev anti-evolution evidence have you seen used in support of evolution? Provide quotes if you can. Send out a tweet, tweet on Twitter telling us about your favorite non-evidence evidence for evolution. Include the hashtag oxymorons for evolution or email us your favorite quote and example to comments at genesisweek.com or paste it on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. We want to hear from you. Please remember that Genesis Week is a viewer-supported program. If you like the program, please consider donating towards the expenses as it does sadly cost a lot of money to produce the program. I put my time into it for free, but it does have production costs. Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation and you can chip in either by donating online or mail here, or even buying some DVDs as the profits from those sales go towards the cost of the show. Thank you for your support and please do pray for all of us involved in production. We need your prayers. A recent report came out in the journal Zoo Keys, claiming that dinosaurs went extinct in Europe at the same time as dinosaurs in North America. Ha! Who'd have thunk? Now, of course, we have to take a lot of what was said with a grain of salt here, because they used evolutionary timescales and the alleged asteroid impact event to time when these dinosaurs died. But it's interesting to note that the researchers pointed out that the majority of evidence for an asteroid impact killing off the dinosaurs comes from North America. When they concluded that the dinosaurs in Europe also died at the same time, they deemed this as evidence that the asteroid killed off the dinosaurs in Europe as well. Now this is very interesting on multiple levels. First of all, as catastrophists, creationary scientists would agree that the fossil dinosaurs we find in Europe were killed off at the same time as the ones in North America. We would just say it was the global flood of Noah that killed off the dinosaurs. You know, that global thing in global flood. What's even more interesting is that the alleged evidence that it was an asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs in North America is actually very weak. In fact, one could say the evidence just doesn't stack up. This is why when you read the studies conducted on dinosaur graveyards here in North America, the researchers invariably attribute the dinosaur deaths to, wait for it, a flood. <laughs> Look it up for yourself. I go into more details in Creeper Rant number 17, Dinosaurs and Asteroids, where we explore the various theories about what killed the dinosaurs. Aliens? Tractor trailers? Chuck Norris? All of the evidence points conclusively to a flood. I would say it was a worldwide flood, the judgment of God on a wicked people. That worldwide flood was symbolic of another judgment to come. Jesus warned us that just like in the days of Noah, people were drinking and marrying, and then the judgment came and took them all away. Jesus warned there was another judgment to come, and just like the flood, it would come at a most unexpected time. But, like Noah warning the people of old, we have been warned. Jesus said to escape that judgment, you must be born again. What does that mean? It means turning from your sins, asking Jesus for forgiveness, and giving your life completely and wholly to him. And he will give you eternal life. What's keeping you from making him the Lord of your life today? Stick around. We'll be back in one minute. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12 DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. 
Visit Ian's Bookstore today. our Facebook page. Hi, Ian. I really enjoy watching Genesis Week and the Crevo rants keep up the good work. What would you say to the claim that there are too many fossils present in the layers to have been buried during a single event such as Noah's Flood, that they represent more than what could have been alive at any one time? Mark is referring to a point that was made in passing in a debate by a Noah Flood skeptic. Now, while the skeptic did not provide any details, nor back up his argument in any way, shape, or form, there's no doubt he's referring to the common fallacious argument concocted by the anti-creationists regarding the Karoo Formation in South Africa. Now, this old argument was popularized on Tot.Organs years ago, and in particular, one of the original authors of Tot.Organs, Robert Shadowald. On the Talk Organs, Problems with the Global Flood page, you can see one example of the atrociously bad science of falsely so-called. Robert E. Sloan, a paleontologist at the University of Minnesota, has studied the Karoo Formation. He asserts that the animals fossilized there range from the size of a small lizard to the size of a cow, with the average animal perhaps the size of a fox. A minute's work with a calculator shows that if the 800 billion animals in the Karoo Formation could be resurrected, there would be 21 of them for every acre of land on Earth. Suppose we assume, conservatively I think, that the Karoo Formation contains 1% of the vertebrate land fossils on Earth. Then when the flood began, there must have been at least 2,100 living animals per acre, ranging from tiny shrews to immense dinosaurs. To a non-creationist mind, that seems a bit crowded. Yes, but the non-creationist mind also believes that it was the result of random processes and not intelligent design. So why on earth should we trust any thought that comes out of a mind that claims it was created by randomness? I certainly wouldn't trust the computations of a computer that was created by random natural processes. But I digress. Shadowall has completely missed the boat on so many points it's difficult to know where to begin. First of all, his uniformitarian mindset subtly rears its ugly head. He assumes that the layers of the Karoo Formation represent time periods and not a large formation that was a flood wash. A flood wash would have accumulated animals from a much larger area, channeling them into smaller areas, just like we see in floods today. So while the 800 billion animals of the Karoo Formation probably represents a washed-in collection of animals from a much larger area, let's go with his numbers and assumptions at face value. Is there a problem with 2,100 animals per acre? Would they live in harmony or completely starve themselves because they ate all the plants? You might be surprised to find out that actually we have population numbers much larger than that in existence today. For instance, there is an estimated 300 cape girdled lizards and 15 angulate tortoises per hectare. Chameleons live in densities of 10 to 50 per hectare. You'll find population densities of iguanas at almost 900 per hectare. Anoles up to 110,000 per hectare. Manchurian Island pit vipers can be found as much as 10,000 per hectare, and Colorado rattlesnakes over 1,200 per hectare. Yeah, that makes you want to visit Colorado now, doesn't it? Geckos can produce populations of, get this, up to 67,600 per hectare. That's over 28,000 per acre. That's right, seven per square yard. Even larger animals, such as mammals, can produce surprisingly high population densities, such as the deserts of Utah, where you'll find 14 to 41 mammals per hectare. In fact, not only did the Karoo fossils not present a problem for creation and a young Earth, 
they do present a huge problem for the evolutionary timescale because the fossil populations are nowhere near high enough. We're talking about these layers being assumed to form over millions of years. Where are all the fossils? Even large animals, such as the elephants, can produce incredibly huge populations in a very short amount of time. As Michael Ord showed, using elephant reproduction rates to estimate woolly mammoth reproduction rates, you can get 1.3 billion mammoths in just 300 years. Elephants, and presumably mammoths as well, have a gestation period of over a year and a half and don't reach sexual maturity until 10 to 23 years old. It's not like they can breed like rabbits. But even with such low reproduction rates, you can see what incredible populations even large mammals can produce in a very short amount of time. Now, let's extrapolate such population densities to millions of years, not hundreds, millions. The evolutionary camp believes the Karoo formation was a mass extinction event, a catastrophe. Where's all the fossils of all the animals? The elephant in the room, so to speak, is the lack of extreme numbers of fossils in the Karoo formation, not the low numbers we actually find. So contrary to what the global flood skeptic argued, the fossil populations are actually a huge problem for evolution in deep time, not creation and a young earth. Thanks for writing in, Mark. Well, that's it for this week. I'm your host, Andrew. Be signing off for now and saying thank you for watching. We realize there is a lot of competition out there for your viewership, and we are so pleased that you took the time out of your day to watch Genesis Week. I hope you'll join me again next week. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, hate mail, and your winning Tim Hortons roll up the rim tabs to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at Genesis Week, or you can head on over to genesisweek.com, find the most recent show, and leave a comment there. Or you can head on over to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Genesis Week TV. Remember those words of comfort and warning from our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjubi.org slash donations. And thank you for your support. Thank you.